Hi guys, it's Jumpstart CS here and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to start a brand new tutorial series on RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ is a distributed message broker. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what a message broker is, it's basically software that allows applications to communicate with each other and exchange messages. A message could indicate something like a user has added a new product to their cart in an e-commerce application or perhaps saying that a user is signed into their account from a new device. So you might ask yourself, why would I want to use a message broker in my application? A message broker tends to add a bit of complexity over a simple API based system, but can have many benefits, especially in the long run. Using message brokers is popular as it allows an engineer to create loosely coupled application and allows new parts of the system to be seamlessly added without affecting our existing system. It is commonly used in microservices style architecture and so is a must know topic for developers. Most message buses, including RabbitMQ, operate asynchronously, which means that they do not follow a simple request reply pattern where we have to wait on replies. We'll get into this later, but using this approach alongside modern microservices architecture allows us to achieve great scale and reliability. Later in the series, we'll jump into exactly how a message broker like RabbitMQ helps us to achieve this when we look at some of its common applications. As you can see from their website, RabbitMQ is the most widely deployed open source message broker. It's seriously popular. It's used from massive multinational tech companies like Reddit, Accenture and NASA, as well as being widely adopted by a range of startups throughout the world. It's super quick to install and get started, which makes it great for prototyping and can be deployed on many popular clouds like AWS, Azure, and GCP. The RabbitMQ site is a great place to get started, and I'll put the link in the description. You can see at the time of recording, the latest version is 3.9.8, and the website also has great details on how to get involved in the community, as well as docs, supports, and a blog. Speaking of features, RabbitMQ has an absolute ton of features, and can even be extended through a range of plugins to support various different scenarios. It comes with a built-in management UI, which we can see on screen here, and we will use this in our course to understand exactly what RabbitMQ is doing with our messages. RabbitMQ is very lightweight with the core RabbitMQ platform requiring less than 40 megabytes of RAM to run. We can see here in the management UI, we have an overview of everything that RabbitMQ is doing. We can monitor connections, channels, exchanges, queues and these are all things that we will explain in the upcoming video we can also see some statistics around disk reads disk writes and information around what ports and users are using our RabbitMQ environment we're going to start off this tutorial series by looking at installing RabbitMQ on several different platforms and then looking at the absolute basics of how to get started using it as quickly as possible we will take a quick look at how RabbitMQ uses AMQP as its default messaging protocol. As we stated earlier, the core of this series will look at how we can use RabbitMQ features to solve some core architectural problems that are often encountered in a distributed computing environment. These are techniques that will allow us to easily scale applications deployed on-premise or in the cloud, as well as ensuring these applications are highly available. These architectural patterns are some of the most in-demand skills in the technology sector and a deep understanding of them is valuable across industries regardless of the tech stack. RabbitMQ has client libraries built on many popular languages. We will mostly use Python and c -sharp in this series but we will focus mostly on concepts and what we will cover will equally be as applicable in other languages where client libraries exist such as Java, PHB, Ruby, Go and many others. To wrap up the series, we will cover some of RabbitMQ's more advanced features, including setting up RabbitMQ as a cluster of nodes and techniques to make your RabbitMQ solution highly available and even spread across multiple data centers in the cloud. I hope this video has given you a good introduction and overview of what RabbitMQ is and what we're going to cover in this course. In the next video, we'll get started on installing RabbitMQ locally on our machines. If you want to learn more about RabbitMQ, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like the video if you enjoyed it. Remember, an application's architecture is only as good as its weakest point, so check out my other tutorials to find out about the other in-demand skills that you can use to take your development to the next level.